welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We are thrilled that you have chosen to spend your time with us either live or watching the recording. We always want to say thank you to our presenting sponsors. They believe in us. They allow this conversation to continue on our episodes here, as well as the sector at large. So these sponsors that you see here on your screen believe in the work you do. They're there to support you. They're there to serve you. So please do go find them, like them, follow them, and give them some love for everything that they do in our sector. We want to welcome, of course, Julia Patrick. This was her brainchild. She said, I have this crazy kooky idea. It'll last two weeks. And here we are on episode number 214. Wow. So number 14, but who's counting? Um, Julia is the wow. CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and I'm very grateful to serve alongside as her co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransel, also known as the Nonprofit Nerd, CEO of my own consulting group, the Raven Group. So we want to welcome today's guest. Um, you've got to know a little bit about him in our Chitty Chat Chat session, but Gary Knight joins us as the Executive Director of San Diego Futures Foundation. Welcome to you, Gary. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to be here. You know, Gary, we are so excited to hear what you have to say, because 20 years of an organization is a milestone for any anybody in the nonprofit sector, mm -hmm. but 20 years of an organization that was dedicated, that has been dedicated to technology has got to be almost unheard of. Well, we're one of the few. Uh, I mean, there's organizations that have been around for a while, but uh, when you look back at our history, uh, there haven't been, as you say, a lot of organizations that have been around for 20 years doing this work. It's somewhat unique. Yeah. So talk to us about what your mission is and actually what SDFF does. I mean, it's, um, I'm, I'm assuming that technology has changed. And so maybe your mission has changed over those 20 years or perhaps not. Well, it's uh, so when my our board formed us, uh, they had one overarching view, uh, and this was to improve lives through technology. So a simple statement, but so encompassing, correct? Uh, sure. So when you look at what we do, uh, we started off <clears throat> initially as a computer uh, uh, refurbisher and distributor. So we were formed when the county of San Diego decided to outsource their IT services and they needed, some, they needed an organization to accept the computers that were being retired, and they wanted to get them back out in the community. So they had a contractor, and they said, please form a nonprofit to do that, and that's how the Futures Foundation was formed. And so for the first few years, that's all we did. We took a computer, we cleaned it up, we refurbished it, repaired it, and then we put new software, re, what we call re-imaging, and then found a home for it. So it was either with individuals in the community that were considered in the underserved population and or with nonprofits because they had a mission to serve individuals and many times their technology was older than the people they were serving. And sometimes, you know, and if you're serving seniors, that's a lot to say, right? <laughs> so, well, I think of the technology world. And so if SDFF has been around for 20 years, there have been so many advancements, improvements, evolution to yeah. this technology world there has been uh but at, at the foundation a computer is a tool it's a you know it's a computer it may be it may get faster it may get sleeker it may get thinner you know just like all of us right <laughs> uh, but but the reality is it still does what it was supposed to do which is take and process using software information but nowadays the reality is, is we went from a computer-based form, meaning that you had software loaded on a computer, and that's where you worked. Everything was done at that position. Right. But now, it's internet. Now, everything is, you know, we talk about the cloud. We talk about, you know, being up in the internet. And the reality of 2020, uh, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, you know, 20 years of talking about the importance of this, and suddenly 2020, everybody said, you know what, this is important. So uh, being a, a, a prophet, a, a soothsayer, a uh, oracle, I'll take credit for that. No. <laughs> oh, my God. But, but the idea is that now everybody's trying to figure out how can we utilize this tool to assist people 
and the reality of our world, which is connected. It is no longer a disconnected world. Everything that we do is based on technology. So when I go back to the original statement, improving lives through technology is simple, but now very encompassing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was thinking um, as we talk about the digital divide, I remember I was um, probably out of college and I heard about this sometime in the early 90s, um, read a book by Nicholas Negroponte that it was like so futuristic, so futuristic. And I remember so specifically, he wrote about the digital divide and how this was going to be one of the great scourges of the planet. And at the time, I, I really didn't even hardly know people that had computers, let alone thinking all these fantastical thoughts about how they would become something that were, they were on our bodies and form the form of phones and all this. So it seems to me really interesting that you have marched on this course of understanding the digital divide and what the implications are. And I'd love for you to share with us what you see and what you think is gonna happen. Sure, so I'll start off with the very basic. Why don't you take everything that's electronic right around you, and that would include your computer, your phone, all the other things, and just remove them. And now I'm gonna tell you, go ahead and perform your daily activities and work and all the other things you do without them. And you'd say, well, it's impossible, can't do it. And that's, that's the implications of the digital divide. Our world, so often uh, we deal with people that uh, are, let's say immigrants or people who have been uh, resettled in areas as refugees. And San Diego, where we're at, is a, uh, one of the ones that gets a lot of refugees. Mm -hmm. And they may come from a world where technology was not present. Yeah. And then we say, okay, here's what you need to do. Uh, right now, let's say in 2020, you need to go online for your school, for your kids. You need to be able to sign up for services. So go online and do that. We need you to, and everything, uh, make a phone call, make, you know, whatever. And so our world, so connected now, doesn't allow us to do very much without being able to understand and, and utilize it. I was going to say manipulate, but that's you know, no. really what it is. It, it is. It's being able to use the tools that we have to accomplish the tasks that are being put before us. And so I'll give you a number that's still startling to me is that this is about two, maybe three years old, but they did a survey and they figured that People who either do not have a computer, that do not know how to use it, or do not have access to internet, we're roughly 400,000 plus in San Diego County, and we're 3 million people. Wow. And that is true pretty much as a, as a statistic across all uh, areas of the country, some worse, some better, but realistically, it can be anywhere up to 20 to 30% of the people in any given area lack either a computer, the skills, or the access to the internet to be able to function. And so we, you know, and I, one time, uh, one of my predecessors wanted to take our organization very broadly across the country. And our board came back and said, when we've gotten San Diego covered, then we can talk about moving on. So realistically, we still face that. And it changes only in terms of the ones we were able to help. That's great. But right behind them is another group of people. And so it seems like we're just continuing to you know, chip away at it, but that's our purpose, that's our goal. And so we try to solicit, and, and thank you very much for having us on, we try to solicit as many partners as possible to assist us in that, either through computer donations, through uh, giving us access to uh, resources, funding, you know? So uh, that's how we sort of continue to approach it. But the implications are, are great. And all I can say is that I could list off hundreds of them but the reality is try to function, think about it, try to function in a world that's connected without that ability. Right. Jerry, well, you have a question? Yes, I was going to say, you know, here we are in 2021, albeit not that far into it, and it still feels like 2020, <laughs> but we certainly saw this digital divide or really just that, that equitable access to what you just said, Gary, um, the actual technology itself, the bandwidth, the internet connectivity, and I was so impressed by the innovation from so many school districts, organizations like yourself that really stepped up to the plate to provide solutions to these areas of, you know, 
internet uh, and technology desert. So I think that has been phenomenal. And as you said in our chitty chat chat session, you know, this is something that you and your organization have had a finger on the pulse for quite some time. But now we are awake. We are realizing that this is something that is, oh, we should be paying attention to this. And now it's almost like everyone has their attention to this technology world. And it's, it's, I'll I'll use this analogy and I hope people can appreciate it. It's like whack-a-mole, the game (laughs) where you go to the arcade and it pops up and you hit it and then it goes down and something pops up over here. So every time we think we've got something addressed, something new pops up. Sure. Right. So uh, as we're dealing with the internet, uh, one of the things that came up, and this is something we're working on very uh, aggressively right now in terms of trying to address it. And that is we put out literally thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of computers into the community from various sources to address the digital divide in regards to students, K through 12 and going to school. Well, think about it. You don't have a lot of experience. You haven't had a computer in the past. So we give you this box and we give you an internet connection. We say, go. And you're saying, okay, how? Yeah. So I don't know how to use it. And therefore I've got to make it work. So I see on the screen, that's exactly right. We have to provide digital literacy training. We have to teach people now how to go about using this box, this thing that was dumped on your your doorstep, how to connect it up to the internet and then how to make it work to you. And I'd say that we are failing. And what I mean by that is that the statistics right now, and it, it has a lot more to do just than knowing how to use a computer, but the statistics are that almost half the students that are taking online courses aren't, aren't doing well. They're not thriving. Mm-hmm. They're failing. And because so, of that proficiency, if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's really that literacy and proficiency when it comes to technology. It's, it's part of that. Okay. Uh, I'd say part of that, part of it is there's a technical side. So as we've dumped these things on your desk, what happens if they don't work properly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who do you call? Well, the school district started getting thousands and thousands and thousands of calls. And they had three people that were not designed to answer those kinds of calls, trying to respond to them. So a majority of them were getting answered. And so that's one of the things we're addressing now is can we help by providing technical assistance? Once again, we've been doing for years, but we don't have the capacity within ourselves to do it. And then the other part of the whack-a-mole problem is that the internet, and I'll I'll use this example, you know, we were so proud that we've been able to get uh, schools and libraries being able to extend their Wi-Fi. Sure. And then we started working with a group that was trying to address those that were homeless or are very transient. And if they're not there to long term, how do they get internet? And they have children. It's not like, you know, they don't have families. Right, right. So we started working with them to acquire a Wi-Fi hotspots that could be taken out to families and be able to address them. So these can be hooked up pretty much anywhere. As long as you have a wireless capability, 4G connectivity uh, through a, a phone service, you can connect up to a wireless hotspot. And so going back to what we're talking about, you know, technology is broad, but it has to have all the components put together to really make it usable. And so that's where we sort of come in and try to address the various issues that pop up. Some we do successfully, some we do fairly well, and some we're still struggling at trying to trying to address the uniqueness or the unique uh, problems of both from the technology standpoint, but also the user standpoint. Gary. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jared. Well, I have a question and I'm, I'm a mother. I have a 10 year old son. You know, he, you, you name the device, he has it, right? right. So, um, but what, do you, what does your organization do or provide support when it comes to that security and safety? Right. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time on and we have had to transition like everybody else from in-person classes to mm-hmm. online uh, classes, but we provide a regular courses on cybersecurity. And so I'll address your particular problem, which is your 10 year old or your 12 year old child uh, having fairly free access, right? And they're mm-hmm. vulnerable. And mm-hmm. so part of it is, is working with parents to understand what tools are available to them to be able to uh, provide guidance and oversight 
in their, in their child's connection because it's a pipe. You know, the internet's a pipe and unfortunately it's good and it can also be very bad. Sure. And so now uh, take it. What about a person who's 75 or 80, didn't grow up with technology, sitting at home and like my mother who was in her 90s, gets a call and somebody says, we're from the IRS or we're from the social security. We need your social security number. Yeah. She grew up in a time where it's trusting, right? So if they're on the phone, they're calling, they say they're from the IRS, they may be, you know, they must be a legitimate. So she starts to give her, give them their information. Sure. And fortunately, my wife was available and stopped her immediately. But how many times is that replicated across the country and people losing their life savings? And- Absolutely. I do that every time I'm with my mom who is in that age bracket. Mm-hmm. I I take her phone. I clean it. First of all, like literally like what are all of these (laughs) ads that you're getting just crazy, you know, crazy promotionals. I clean it. I put some measurements in place and then it's like, okay, one, this should be running a lot faster now. (laughs) Two, I've put some own security measures for you because this is not stuff you need clogging up or really access to because if you hit the wrong button, the wrong link, the wrong, whatever, Yes, there is so much, you know, possibility that could be dark. Yes. So we, you know, we and we try to address it from a positive standpoint, but it's trying to teach people first be aware and then how to utilize the tools that are there to help them stay safe, well, as safe as possible. Because let's be realistic. Every time we create a defense, there's somebody out there trying to figure out how to break it. Yes. So that's part of it is trying to also stay up with the available resources that are out there. You know, Gary, let's switch gears a little bit yeah. and talk about your e-waste recycling program. You mentioned when we first got chatting about um, how that was the genesis of your organization. Right. You were refurbishing pieces. I have a question about how long um, technology, you know, the, the actual hardware, what the lifespan is. Because I keep, I'm amazed at how short term our hardware is. It seems like, you know, you hear some more, a lot of times like three years and you're behind the curve and you need to get, right. an, you know, new stuff to run your business or your organization. And I'm wondering if you could kind of talk about that. Sure, I'd be glad to. So the reality is, is that three years is a pretty common number utilized uh, by business and industry because three years is a lease period, typically, right? You take your okay. computer, you divide it up in three years, once it's done, you remove it, you replace it. Uh, that's sort of three and four years with the county of San Diego, which we still get a lot of uh, most of their computers or all of them, really. Uh, some businesses may stretch out the five. But the reality is, is that a computer is still good as long as it operates and the software is still functional, right? Mm-hmm. So what three years at the end of that life cycle is still a new computer to somebody who's never had one. That's right. And when they get it, we've taken the time to clean it up, to reload software that's current, as current as possible, that'll work on that computer. And then for them, it'll still do the things they need. It'll still connect to the internet. It'll still be able to track a budget on an Excel spreadsheet if we teach them how to use it. You know, it'll still allow you to send emails and receive them, uh, go, surf the internet for what they need. So it's still functional many times seven or 10 years out, even longer. Uh, and so one of the things that we do at our location is also provide what we call break and fix. So a lot of people don't want to get rid of their computers. They have so much on it and the fear of trying to take their data and transfer it. So we provide that service as a means of continuation. But reality is sometimes the computer comes to an end. It dies. The blue screen of death. Blue right? screen of death. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, then we take the computers and we recycle them. We've done millions of pounds of recycling. We call it downstreaming. We make sure we work with reputable organizations that do not put it into the landfill, that find a way of breaking the components down and making sure that they're reused, right? So uh, it's critical that people be aware of that. Uh, And a lot of people still drop batteries in their trash cans, right? So it's understanding that things have a long life cycle and the, compete, the process is make sure if you're done with it to get it either into a hands like ours where we can reuse it or into a recycler's hands that'll dispose of it in a responsible manner. So I have a question in, in our time is, is shockingly almost up. 
How do you sell your nonprofit to the donor community and the funder community? Because it seems like um, you're dealing with things that a lot of people don't even understand or consider. Um, How do you sell yourself? How do you get that investment from the funding community? Well, it's been, again, going back for 20 years, you know, we've had both the fat years and the lean years, right? So it really depends on what's going on around us. Uh, when, and I'll use this example, and like, I think you just quoted somebody, uh, uh, what was the quote from Ron Emanuel? Never, never let a waste, good- Never waste a good crisis. Never waste a good crisis. So we have to utilize that same strategy. Uh, when there's situations such as high unemployment, uh, like we've been talking about being forced to, to shelter at home, right? So those are times where we can, are able to communicate our message to funders because it's reality. It's, they're dealing with problems. Uh, we do, over the years, we've created a lot of workforce readiness training to teach people how to use computers so they can go out and get jobs. Um, we actually have taught coding programs. How do we, and then co- right now we're working on putting together computer technician support programs to do this response to what happens when a family gets a computer but needs help, where do they go? There is no, if you were to go to a commercial uh, provider and this is not evil against them, they have to pay their people, but you're gonna pay between 90 and $150 an hour to get somebody to answer a question for you or repair your computer. Um, most people can't afford that who are living you know, on minimum wage or a paycheck to paycheck. So we're looking at how can we stand up a community-based a no cost uh, service that answers these kinds of questions that allows them then to do the work they need. So, uh, you know, it's, there's always, a ch- and I don't mean to keep coming back to that, but there's always a challenge and it's trying to then position a way that a funder can understand it and understand how vast it is and how important it is to the community that they're trying to serve. And so uh, it really depends on the circumstance, the needs. And right now, I hate to say it, but it's an easy, easy uh, proposition. Uh, right. Next year, the 2021, it may not be as easy. And they may go back to rethinking it and thinking that, you know, there's other things that are more important. But, uh, a good friend of mine works for the food bank. He heads that up. And I keep trying to say it, you know, I wish I had your story. People can really relate to being hungry. Uh, people don't relate as well to being without an internet connection or without a computer. I remember, Gary, 2009, uh, the last economic crisis. Right. Now, I was chief development officer for a $1 million operating budget nonprofit. Um, my phone was theirs. My laptop was theirs, right? And so when I was a reduction in force at that time, I walked away and couldn't call my friends look for a job, right? So I can wait on that level, right? It's how often, because now when we do look around, looking right here in my, you know, studio, it's like, oh yeah. When you said take, you know, put all your technology in one pile and don't touch it. Like I feel naked. I feel like, how do I do this? Right. We certainly would not have the nonprofit show or have you on this episode to share more about SDFF. So, you know, if we could put a crystal ball in your hand, right. if we could ask you, what does 2021 look like, not only for your organization, but if you can go further right into that digital world, what would you say? Um, you know, I, I think that technology is always, I mean, everybody has a great idea and if they can get their idea funded and then developed, right? So new technology will continue to come along uh, again, if we if we simplify it and say that's the tool part, right? So it, I don't care if it's a hammer or a chisel or something else, you'll use it for the needed purpose. But if you look at then what makes it more valuable is in the context you're using it. So I think that as we look forward, it'll really be the internet. It'll really be the resources that are made available to people to connect. Um, you know, many times we talk about being a connected world but yet we try to say, you know what, kid, uh, go back to your child, get off the technology, get outside and play with your friends, right? Right, Um, go ride a bike. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So it's really being able to utilize technology in the world that you should be living in, but I'll also use another example. One of the areas that we really had to address a few years back was the senior, the age population. One of the largest disconnected 
because mm -hmm. they didn't grow up with technology. So it's uncomfortable to them. But mm -hmm. as we as we start to get older, we get diseased, we get injured, we don't have the capability of getting around as we used to the mobility. And so many times become isolated. And that isolation leads to depression. And that depression leads to lack of staying up with their health, the treatment plans they're put on, they disconnect from families and friends. So being able to provide technology into that space has been very important to us uh, for both the physical health and the mental health of the seniors that we serve. And then trying to teach them how to use a computer. And it, that becomes trying to teach, you know, going back to the joke, trying to teach a five-year-old. Uh, they haven't grown up with it. So we have to start from the very rudimentary basics and teach them, you know, here's how you turn it on. Here's where to plug it in. Here's how to, you know, get online. Here's how to use the emails. Here's how to use, uh, you know, whatever the whatever the features are, Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever it is that they're using to connect up with their family and friends. Those but, are uh, constantly changing. Yeah. So I think, that the, you know, the crystal ball side of me is not so much the tool itself, the computer or the technology there. It's more about how it's going to be used, used appropriately, responsibly. And then how does that change as we look out to all the various community needs? And then how do we address them appropriately? Right now, one of the big uh, things we're hearing about is social equity or, or racial equity. Well, guess what? The computer is a neutral platform. It doesn't show race or it doesn't show social equity. So we're trying to teach people how this could be a tool to address those kinds of problems. Um, one of the things we dealt with very early on is what happens when someone comes to this country and doesn't speak the language well? Well, guess what? Translation programs are built into our software. So they can actually type something in their language and translate it to English so I can understand it. We do a lot of work. One of our training programs we've been doing for the last five years is we call our adaptive technology. We work with blind or near blind people to teach them how to use a computer then how to use the software. Well, <clears throat> think about this. What happens if I received a letter in the mail and I was blind? I'd have to find somebody to read it to me. Nowadays, you get an email and there's software that will translate that email into sound that you can hear it and then be able to respond to it. So the world of connectivity has really made a major difference to the blind and near blind. So now we train them and many of them are going out and getting jobs. We have, I think, three of our trainers that used to be students of ours wow. that have learned it and now are training others in how to use it. So what I'm trying to get to, it's really demand of what's needed and that's how we'll try to respond. And I think that will just change as our needs continue to evolve and are identified by organizations like ours about what's really important, how are we gonna address it? Amazing, Gary, this has been fascinating. And I, I think it's been so timely. I want everyone to see um, sdffutures.org, um, their, their website here. It's a great site. It's really an interesting thing. If you're in, a, in another part of this country and you're looking to maybe understand how your community can do something like this or what's possible, check out the site. It's amazing. 20 years, they've got a lot of time and service under their belt. So it's a really cool thing to be able to have that resource. Gary, it's been fabulous, fabulous to have this discussion. Again, I'm everybody, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I've been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett <laughs> Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Um, we are so excited that we could have another dynamic conversation um, such as this, thanks to our sponsors. So we certainly want to um, give everybody some love there. Um, without you, we would not have this discussion. Again, another fabulous conversation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank and if one, you thing I can, one thing I can do is encourage people. Uh, there are organizations like ours across the country. So if you're listening in another part of the world, uh, reach out, see if there's one like us, and then uh, reach out and uh, ask for them to uh, be able to see if they can help you or your clients. Great. I love it. Well, yeah. you know what? And we're big on uh, collaboration. We talk about that all, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, as we end every show, we want to remind everybody with our, our little mantra that we always say, and that is stay well so you can do well. Hey, everybody, join us tomorrow, Friday, our Ask and Answer episode. It's a lot of fun. We have some math questions tomorrow. Oh. Mm -hmm. I better bring my, my technology that has a calculator. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Calculator. 
<laughs> there you go. Yeah. I mean, literally we had to put up a formula on one of the answers. Ooh, that's a teaser. So come on and join us again. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful and safe day. We'll see you back here tomorrow.